download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1 You are going to hear a woman talking to a university librarian on the phone about the library membership. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. This is the University Library Help Desk. Oh, hello. I'm calling to find out about library membership. I'm not a student, but I understand that I can still use the library? That's right. You can register as an external member. We have several specialist libraries on the university site and you'd be able to use all of them. And how much does that cost, please? It's £80 a year, unless you've been a student here in the past and then it's only £50. Well, no, I haven't, so I'd pay the higher fee. And am I able to borrow books and bring them home? Yes, you can borrow a maximum of six books at a time for four weeks. That's as long as they're not on the reserved list. If they're reserved, it means they have to be read here in the library. OK, that's fine. And I should warn you that as an external member, you wouldn't have access to the computers. That's the only thing. Oh, that wouldn't matter. So, how do I join? Well, you can register online, or you can do that now while you're on the phone, if you like. Yes, please. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 4 to 10. OK then, I'll just take some details from you if you don't mind. So, starting with your full name. Francis Gillingham. That's G-I-L-L-I-N-G-H-A-M. Fine. And is that Miss, Mrs or...? Miss. And can you tell me what your current job is, or are you a student somewhere else? I used to be a teacher, but now I'm a writer, so I need to use the library for my research. OK, got that. And your address, please. That's 112 Bridge Street. Right. And I assume that's here in Chester, is it? That's right. And it would be useful to have a phone number, either a landline or a mobile, whichever you prefer. No problem. My mobile number is 07743-961408. OK, nearly there now. Would you like my email address too? That's just what I was about to ask for. <laughs> it's technical at swiftair.com. Is that T-E-C-H-N-I-C-A-L? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, you'll get your membership card the first time you come along, but can you tell me which of our libraries you'd like to pick it up from? Uh, the business library or... The engineering library, or... Uh, education, please. 
That's the one nearest the main entrance, isn't it? Yes, that's right. It doesn't mean that you have to use that library all the time. You can use any of them. Right. Well, the last thing is payment. How would you like to pay? I can take a card payment right now, or you can pay by cheque or in cash at the library desk next time you come in. I'll pay now, please. Sure, no problem. If you'd just like to hold on a moment, I'll... That is the end of part one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a woman giving a lecture about her research in predicting the future. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Hi there. I'm going to tell you today about some research I've recently done about how terrible people are at predicting the future. I got involved in this because it was a college assignment that a mate of mine was set. She was very busy and it sounded interesting. I didn't have to go into work for a few days so I said I'd help her by seeing if I could find some examples online of poor predictions. Well, I soon found lots of inaccurate predictions simply by googling the words bad predictions. Many of the predictions I then looked at were wrong because people tend not to recognise how important a new invention would turn out to be. I don't suppose that's surprising Generally speaking, it's not easy for most people to understand how big an impact something totally new might have. You'd imagine it would be easier for people with specialist knowledge of the area to realise the potential of a new invention, but I was amazed to find that that doesn't, in general, seem to be the case. Not many of them were accurate either. Some of the bad predictions I read about are actually quite well known. I hadn't heard before the prediction in 1899 that radio had no future. However, I imagine most people are now familiar with the famous claim made in 1977 that there was no reason why anyone would want to have a computer in their own home. I also remember reading once how someone said when TV was first invented that the word for television was half Latin and half Greek and so no good could come of it. Mind you, I suppose there may be some people who'd argue that no good has in fact come of TV, even if it has been a huge commercial success. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 20. So, 
let me tell you about some more of the inaccurate predictions I found while searching the internet. They seem to have affected all types of development in science and technology. In medicine, for example, in the second half of the 19th century, Queen Victoria's surgeon said no wise surgeon would ever get involved in doing an operation on a patient's brain. New ways for people to communicate with one another seem frequently to have taken everyone by surprise. Western Union, a financial services and communications company in the USA, said in 1877 that a telephone system was irrelevant as it had too many problems to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The British were equally wrong. The chief engineer of the British Post Office said in 1876 that the Americans might find a use for telephones, but the British did not require them, as they had plenty of messenger boys. Transport is another area where we've often got it wrong. When railways first came along, a professor of natural philosophy, as physics was then known, put forward the opinion that high-speed rail travel would not be possible because passengers would be unable to breathe and would die as a result. Many false predictions have also been made regarding the technology of war. A French professor of strategy at the beginning of the 20th century said that aeroplanes were interesting toys, but they were of no military value. What a pity he got it so wrong! A similar mistake was made by the Italian inventor Marconi. He said that the development of radio would make war impossible because it would make war ridiculous. And even a great brain like that of the unique theoretical physicist Albert Einstein can make mistakes. In 1932, he claimed that nuclear energy would never be created. But I think my own prediction has much more chance of being accurate. My own prediction is that whatever we predict about the future of science, technology and society almost certainly won't come true. That is the end of part two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to part three. Part three. You are going to hear two students discussing job opportunities with the National Park Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Maria. Hi, Jack. Have you got time to talk about work experience for the summer? I was talking to Dr. Jackson, and she thinks that getting a job with the National Park Service would be really useful for our future careers. But we'll have to submit our applications soon. Sure. Let me just get my notes up. Uh, right. Well, I found a couple of things that looked interesting. How about you? Me too. Okay. You start then. Well, first of all, there are vacancies for custodial assistants. The duties are fairly general. You work in the offices and in the lecture rooms, and you do cleaning and painting and general repairs. Hmm. 
The work's not exactly in our field, but I suppose in our spare time we'd be able to explore the park and all the programs that are going on there. Yes, we would. And those positions can be taken up at any time through the year, so we'd be able to apply for dates that fit it in with our university courses. Let's put it on the short list then, shall we? Okay. Then, they want information assistants. They are the ones who greet visitors and answer their questions. And sometimes they take tour groups around the park. Right. I guess they're looking for applicants who get on well with people. That's right. But I think we both do that pretty well. But if you're not feeling sociable, there are vacancies for laboratory assistants, too. You have to wear protective masks for that job, so talking wouldn't be very easy anyway. And what exactly does the job involve? Cleaning up artifacts, you know, historical things they unearth in the park. Hmm. Is there any training? It doesn't say so. Perhaps they assume applicants have done that kind of thing before. And if it's field work, are you allowed to camp out? No need. You stay in trailers, and there's no charge for them. Hmm, that's definitely attractive. Yes, it is. Okay, and what did you find? Well, I found an advert for resource assistants. They have to study the wildlife and identify any non-native species that they find in the park, and then enter them on the park's central database. Really? Well, that would be very relevant for us, wouldn't it? More in line with our course than most of the other jobs. Well, there was another one for landscape assistance. That's more physical. You have to check the trails through the park and clear them if necessary and fix any signposts and steps that are damaged. I really like the sound of that one. But the thing about that job is that you do the work in teams and you have to apply as a group of at least six people. But we could probably get some of the other students in our group interested and make a group application. I'll send an email around now to see who's interested. Okay. It won't hurt to apply for several positions and then decide which we prefer. Fine. Then, remember, Dr. Jackson said if we're applying for work with the National Park Service, we should prepare an academic presentation that we can give if we get an interview. Yes, and we said we'd do one on flying insects, didn't we? We did. So let's just talk it through, shall we? Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, look, I've jotted down a list of ideas. Here. What do you think about starting off with the subject of habitats? A general overview. I think that should work well as an introduction. I'll see if I can find a map or a diagram so that we don't just stand there talking. So there will be something to look at. Okay. And I thought we could talk a bit about different kinds of traps for catching insects as well. But now I'm not so sure it's a good idea. Hmm, I don't really know. We could ask Dr. Jackson for her opinion. Okay, agreed. I can do that tomorrow. Great. Then there's the subject of classification. How you go about deciding what kind of insect you're looking at. I think that's too important to leave out. So that's a definite, then. Okay. Well, I'll do that, then. Is that all? I'd like to spend a few minutes on the topic of insects as part of the human diet, because they're very nutritious, they're full of protein, and they could be part of the answer to world food shortages. I agree with you about that, 
but our presentation is more from the point of view of studying insects, so I don't think that topic is very relevant. Oh, I see what you mean. Let's leave it then. And also, I've written down environmental benefits too, but I've changed my mind now. We've only got 15 minutes for this presentation. Yes, and that's such a big topic. I think we've got enough to talk about without that. Let's divide up the work and that way. That is the end of part three. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a part of a lecture about wolves in Yellowstone National Park. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I would like to tell you today about quite a well-known situation that occurred in the Rocky Mountains on the west coast of America. A hundred years or more ago, the decision was taken to exterminate wolves. Why? Well, wolves not only frightened the local population, they also killed their cattle and sheep. However, this decision resulted in a number of unexpected problems, particularly in the Yellowstone National Park, an area of great natural beauty and interest. For example, wolves had eaten elk, a kind of large deer common to the area, and because the wolves were no longer around, the number of elk in the park grew. Elk themselves eat a lot of a type of tree called a willow, and, since there were so many more elk, the willows in the park died out. So, the decision was taken to bring wolves back to Yellowstone in the hope that its ecology would be rebalanced and, as far as possible, things might return to their original state. But now, an interesting article has been published by a biologist working in the area. He argues that the situation is much more complicated than anyone had previously realized. The reintroduction of wolves did not have the dramatic positive impact that was hoped for. The article claims that weather conditions have also affected the park. These have brought about modifications to the habitat of various creatures. One of those that has been particularly badly affected by this is the beaver, and there are nowhere near as many of these as there used to be. Their decline has a considerable impact on the environment, also reducing the number of willows that can grow in the area. To put it another way, it now seems that getting rid of wolves in the area was not the only reason why the natural balance of wildlife in the park has undergone such a change. That is the end of part four. You now have some time to check your answers.